Hello and welcome to the after party. I'm No White Guilt, and with me is the Great Order. Folks, HB2014 and Raymond Foster, as well as a host of others, and so glad to see there's so many new folks coming online to make videos of uh, these different segments of the work that we do. Uh, the, but particular today, I want to talk about these two, our video highlight specialists. And if you're not following them on Twitter and retweeting every single thing that they do, you really need to. HB2014 is underscore HB2014. And Raymond Foster is Foster M-M-X-X-I-I. -I. Follow them immediately and help to spread the magnificent clips that these gentlemen take the time to make. And when you have some extra time, reach out ask others find out who else is making clips and then share those clips as well and remember the folks we need to get to right now are folks in the maga community first amendment second amendment regular red-blooded patriots law-abiding across our lands as for the crown winner of last week the crown goes to Dissident Agnostic for gifting a total of 30 Prometheus Rising dollars. Adulations and plaudits, my dear friend, and thank you. And second place was Michael gifting $25. Congratulations and thank you as well. Financially gift on entropy at 15%, which I'll have up in just a moment. And uh, you can watch the stream there. You should be able to, if all things are functioning properly, watch the stream on the afterparty.tv where we would like you to go. You can also ask and vote on questions on Entropy, and those questions will not delete like they will here on the No Why Guilt channel or Discipline with NWG unless you or I delete them. You can also financially gift over on Cash App at 6 percent both of those links are down in the description jared and i as every single one of you know at this point evenly share the financial gifts with our guests here on the after party now today we have the inimitable john bruce leonard on tap welcome john now please uh, introduce yourself to our steam community then uh, tell them where they can find you and uh, what you're working on and then mr george will take us into this coruscating conversation. Jason, I greatly appreciate the epithet, inimitable. Um, at any rate, it's great to be back with you, gentlemen. Thanks so much for having me on. Um, so my name is John Bruce Leonard, and I am uh, a writer. I'm editor-in-chief of Arctos uh, Media Limited, which is a small anti-globalist publishing house, which has been putting out books of a variety of kinds now for um, just over 10 years. We had our 10th anniversary this year, as a matter of fact. Uh, my work can be found on Arctos, and on Arctos we deal with a great many different kinds of subjects, ranging from um, books and works which critique the, the modern uh, trends of the world, which point to some of the difficulties that we're facing in, our, in these very complicated and interesting present times, and which, above all, present some solutions or some ideas and alternatives for how to get out of the, uh, the same complications that we find ourselves in. Um, we touch as well on spirituality, spiritualism in general, religions. We touch on questions of science, um, great many different fields are covered, but our primary emphasis and focus is on uh, dealing with the crisis of our modern times and uh, providing some indications of paths by which we might leave it. Well, on to that, uh, and again, welcome John. If you want to check out John's first appearance, he was on about exactly one year ago. Of course, mm -hmm. go to the aforementioned website, theafterparty.tv, where everything is cataloged. You can search his name or Arctos and uh, it'll easily come up. So that was more of an overview of what John is about, a little more of a broader scope. But now we like to do that when someone's on for the first time, but now that he's a TAP veteran, it's going to be a little more specific. Although maybe specific isn't the best word, it's a specific topic, but it is, it's very wide ranging uh, as John has an incredible range of and depth and breadth really of scope in this article that he wrote a few months ago about the world under COVID. So we're, we're taking a big bird's eye view 
and simultaneously a deep dive into it going back and forth, like changing the lenses on the camera. I put that link to John's article in the chats on DLive and YouTube so far. Moderators, I'm going to put it in on a thread as well. Please do share it at intervals. Um, anyone who listens today, you should definitely reference that article. But we're going to try as best we can to get to and really honor just how wide ranging and important and timely this article is for all of us right now. So having said that, let's jump right into it. You begin by saying early on in the article that a lot of people's interpretations and notions of COVID, and, and again, we're not talking necessarily about the different theories about what this is, uh, the, the disease or lack thereof, but the conditions of the world under COVID and, and what the big picture here is again. So you point out that the variety of beliefs and the seeming inability of many people who are spouting different opinions of even countenancing the others, other beliefs at odds with their own, is actually revealing a deeper undercurrent of how postmodernism has fragmented people, uh, has overly specialized a lot of us, has kind of siloed off our modes of thinking. Uh, a lot of you who know our work know Jason and I are very into promoting a holistic way of thinking and being, and that, that perhaps is somewhat antithetical to modernism. We're gonna get into wider things about modernism later on, but why don't we start from this point and then we'll develop from there. So this was an interesting phenomenon that I noted fairly early on in the, the breakout of this crisis that affected um, actually where I'm living, that is the country in which I'm living, Italy, it affected it before anywhere else in the West. Um, and so uh, I saw this also just on a kind of personal scale with the people that I spoke to here, and it spread from there very rapidly out to the rest of the world, of course. There was this immediate kind of uh, reactivity on the part of many, many commentators, I would say most commentators, who were attempting to get a hold of the, the virus, the pandemic, the political situation, the responses that were taken to it. And what was interesting about these is that they said a lot more, I think, about the individual commentators than they did about the phenomenon itself. Now, of course, to some extent, that's simply a banality. When any person speaks, he's always, to some extent, reflecting simply his, his own worldview. But it came out in a much, much stronger way with this pandemic. And I think that was a combination of things. It had to do with the emergency of the situation. It had to do with the scope of the situation. It had to do with the fact that I think, um, Anyone who is involved in the public sphere in any way, who, who makes podcasts, who writes essays, who writes articles, who writes books, anyone involved in any way within the public sphere had to say something about this. It was just too big to ignore. Um, and everybody had to try to come up with some kind of a view, which was at once independent and interesting when everyone was just throwing out, you know, countless th thousands and thousands of articles every day on um, innumerable journals and things of that sort. And many people, I think, for that reason, took refuge in a certain sense in their most deeply cherished beliefs because they found that this crisis was of such an immediacy and such a global extent that it had in some way to reflect the things that they cherish most, uh, the ideas and the theories that they think are the most pertinent to our situation in the world. And so you had just this incredible array of different responses. I mean, there were people who were claiming that it was uh, the result of environmental degradation, that it was the result of the incapacity of this or that political party, that it was the consequence of political systems like communism or capitalism, that it was uh, a result of globalism, that it was a result of nationalism, that it was a result of any number of different uh, completely contradictory uh, causes. Uh, and this, to me, I think indicates something very telling about our time, the time in which we live. Um, we see this in a, a great many different uh, ways within our, our manner of dealing with the world. Uh, I mean, one of the classic ways I think that this is talked about nowadays is the kind of echo chamber in which each individual finds himself within a kind of closed sphere of like-minded individuals. These are called communities, which I think is actually in a certain sense an abuse of the term. Um, because in a real community, you are forced to confront organically different views about the world. You are forced to confront people who do not like you, in many cases, who are not of your mind, 
uh, in, in communities like small towns and communities like nations, there's always this kind of diversity. In the communities that we talk about today, online communities, we are speaking of individuals with a great homogeneity of opinion. And I think that one of the results of this, one of the consequences of this, is that we are living in a very fragmented society. That kind of organic wholeness, which is natural and native to community, is falling apart. And one speaks of this when one speaks of postmodernism. There are a great many ways in which uh, the postmodern uh, phenomenon is actually uh, a kind of uh, crystallization of this, this great fragmentation of human beings into ever smaller groups, and finally into an utter and um, very isolating individual individualism in the worst sense of that word. So the coronavirus brought this out. It brought it to the fore. And it, it forced us, I think, to confront it. Um, now, there's a great... There are a great many things that could be said about that to kind of further that that on. But I think that the, the primary point that I was simply trying to make is that this is an opportunity as well for us to see ourselves reflected in the world, which is to say we look out, we see that there's this enormity, this, this gargantuan thing which has happened. Whatever its cause is, whatever you think about, you know, whatever you think was the, the origin of the virus, whatever you think uh, brought it about, whatever you think uh, led us to the present point, Whatever you think about the, the, the severity of the virus, it doesn't matter. It's still of such a global and imminent uh, nature that we have to confront it. And in confronting it, I think we are able to confront ourselves if we are open to that kind of um, almost dialectic between the world and our, our own view of the world. Um, but it's very easy at the same time to fall into a number of traps here. Um, and I think the most poignant of those traps is the trap of simply uh, cascading into one's own uh, deepest presuppositions and prejudices about the world to the point that one cannot see other possibilities. And I think that this unfortunately works to um, aggravate a very dangerous and very troubling trend that we see, which is, it goes back to this fragmentation of human beings, this individualization, atomization of human beings. Um, when we are no longer able to confront one another with differences of opinion in a rational way, um, and, and to listen to those other views and to actually try to get to the bottom of them, not only on the rational level, but also on deeper level. And what, are, what are the spiritual reasons or the emotional reasons or the personal reasons that a, a human being would have for embracing these views which are so completely different from our own? Instead, there is a tendency to close down. That person is wrong, and because that person is wrong, that person is dangerous and endangering. That person wants to destroy something that is dear to me. I don't deny that there are these kinds of conflicts in society, but I think that today they are being artificially uh, compounded and artificially multiplied to the extent that we are no longer able to have human discourse and human communications and even simple human relationships. Um, I mean, there have been articles that have proposed that um, in any number of recent events, if you don't agree with certain of your family members on what's going on or you know about this or that aspect of the situation, be it to do with COVID, be it to do with uh, the, the race tensions in the United States, there's a suggestion that you need to cut that person out of your life until that person comes around. And I think that this is just another example of the utter disintegration of our society, uh, which unfortunately we're facing in these days. That's a perfect setup for the next thing uh, that we'd like to discuss. And that is, I pulled a line from your article, our strength is and must be the local, not even the national and certainly not the global. Um, now, I know you caution generally in the article against undue optimism, and I would certainly agree with you, uh, but the line kind of begs further exploration, again, underscored more strongly by what you just stated. Some people are saying, and I've even said this to myself, that if we are looking for silver linings, it would seem that the present situation has given a fair number of people uh, more time if they were furloughed or something like this from their jobs. So they might have uh, developing a deeper appreciation of time with friends and family. We've spoken about women spending more time with their children. We have actually evidence from our own communities right here of women who decided, you know what, I'm not going to go back to work. I'm, I'm gonna be a full-time homemaker and we're gonna readjust our family budgets and whatever we need to do, things of that nature. Uh, people getting off that rat race right. wheel a little bit. Everyone needs to work. Everyone needs to contribute, of course. But I think more people are kind of questioning, what is this all for? I'm a cog in this machine. Well, what's the machine about? And 
Am I really doing something that is worthwhile to me? Less consumerism, all of that. So again, I know you caution against undue optimism and we will get more into that, but what do you make of that kind of angle? So I, I would, let me offer in the first place um, a degree of optimism about what you said, and then I'm going to offer the, the counter view to that position, which I think uh, suggests that we need to be very cautious about that optimism. But then I think perhaps even beyond that, there's, there's reason for more optimism yet. So let me get to those three points. In the first place, I agree entirely with you, Jared, that this is um, an opportunity, uh, and it is an opportunity that many people fortunately have taken to readjust the priorities of one's life and to re- embrace to rediscover certain uh, great joys, great values in our lives that many of us have been compelled to forget by extraordinarily busy schedules, by uh, misplaced ambitions, by um, ideas of the world that place material goods at a much higher level than they ought to be placed. So I've seen this also in, in many of my own personal relations. There have been individuals who have come to me and said, you know, I, I was terrified about the prospect of having to spend all of these weeks at home with my family. You know, it just seems like a terrible, terrible place to be. And in the end, it turned out that I actually found that there was a great deal of joy in that uh, setting and that I had forgotten a lot of things that um, I should have remembered. And I think that that's been the experience of, of many people. I think there have been also other, unfortunately, much less pleasant experiences, which have been the consequence of this. But nonetheless, that is a promising aspect and it needs to be focused on. It, it is an opportunity for us to rediscover certain things that have been lost in the modern world, not to say deliberately buried, um, and to reconsider in particular, I think, aspects of our capitalistic and absolutely frenetic um, yeah. way of just chasing the hour, chasing the minute, chasing the second in order to get everything done within the day, in order to be precisely on time, in order to answer all of our messages and emails, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Now, the other side of that, the, the kind of darker shadow that is cast, I think, by that optimism is the question of uh, what might be coming on the horizon. Now, I see a number of different things. The ones that are most pertinent to this question, uh, I think, is the reality of the absolute transformation which we can expect in our economies in the, the near future. This is owing to a number of different things. The unsustainability of our present debt structures and the uh, incredible uh, proliferation of new technologies which is going to lead to a new kind of industrial revolution. Um, I mean, industrial revolution isn't even the way of putting it. There's a, there's a technological revolution coming, which is going to lead to radical changes in the, in the fabric of our economy. And I think everybody at this point agrees that it's going to lead to a great deal of unemployment. Some people seem to be much more blasé about what that might lead to in the longer term. But I think that one way or another, the only way that this can be sustainable is if um, some kind of support mechanism is provided for all of the people who are falling, falling through the net. And I see that coming out in the greater discussions which are being had around basic, universal basic income and things of this kind. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think that there is a way in which universal basic income can just strike one as being a, a handsome and decent idea. And uh, to an extent, I could imagine it being so in a good society. I think the dangers that are associated with it in our society are not to be underestimated because it becomes an enormously powerful lever which can be used against human beings in order to herd them into ever smaller and smaller chambers in their lives. And I think that it will be it will be pulled out in the near future. I mean, it's, it, they're already talking about it. The United Nations has proposed a kind of universal basic income of the poorest segment of the world in the, in the wake of the coronavirus. We're going to be seeing this more and more, and it's going to be happening on a national level more and more. This is going to be, of course, joined with a, a radical reworking, a reset, as they call it, of our economies. And we need to be ready for all of these things. Now, this plays into what we're talking about, Jared, in the following way. There, it will be very easy, I think, in the wake of this, to bribe the certain individuals, and I use that word advisedly, to give them a, a degree of money, just free money. Here you are, here's your income. This is enough money for you to survive on, and you can 
pursue your passions. You can go and you can spend time with your family. You can do all of these things. You have the world opened up to you. All you have to do is take this money from the government. Now, the question, of course, is always what strings there might be attached to that. And I think that there are a great many of very troubling strings that could be attached to that in the emergence of things like digital currencies, in the emergence of things like a greater uh, fiscal control of, of um, individuals which follow from digital currencies. And it, it will be very easy, I think. It will be very, very just terribly easy to sell ourselves for uh, presumed liberty, which is in fact nothing but a kind of slavery with a facade of freedom attached to it. So that's the darker shadow that's cast by this, uh, this kind of optimistic view of things, because I think that people are being forced into a position in which it will be very, very easy for them to be manipulated. And I think that that's, that has to be recognized and it has to be confronted in some sense. Beyond that, I think that this does provide, however, a golden opportunity and maybe the first one that I've seen in my life for most people to recognize that there is, um, how can I put this? There, there might have to be a way in which they've got to break with the status quo. Uh, they, there's a clarity, I think, which might come out of all of this, which, which can extend to a greater number of people than ever before, because this is a global event and it is something which has affected so many people and the consequences of it are going to affect all of us. The result of that is that it does provide us all an opportunity, even those of us who are much more aware of what's happening than I think most people are. It provides us all an opportunity to see with greater clarity the nature of our society and the lines that we want to draw between our own private personal lives and that society. That line is going to become ever more difficult to draw. We're seeing this with the coronavirus, the line between public and private is absolutely disappearing. But because of the nature of these events and because of the things that you're talking about, Jared, because of this opening, this new awareness of values which have been forgotten or set aside or uh, mischaracterized or in some cases even demonized, we do have this possibility once and for all to establish our proper relationship to the societies in which we live and to try to find within those societies a sane and healthy way forward. Now, I'd like to touch on something, although this was somewhat contained in what you just stated. So we don't need to belabor it if you think we can move on. But my initial question, and you kind of ended up back there in your closing statements, uh, was about someone's private sphere. I was bringing up examples of mothers staying home with children and things like that. Uh, the other thing we'd like to touch on is the more outward looking aspect of this in that um, yes, there are a lot of people who are going along with this as the new normal, a term that I kind of detest, I think many of us do, and caution against. And we need to be aware of the fact that a lot of people are going along with this because they don't want their trinkets and toys of modernity taken away from them and they're still comfortable. We could touch on that as well if you'd like to. But I'm seeing a fair number of people, and I'm talking about just, I'm not talking about online and this community just casual conversations I have out in public with the average person out there. Um, even I'm thinking particularly of one funny exchange I had at a gas station with the two clerks and what they were saying. No one I've spoken to personally, I know this is anecdotal, believes what they're getting from the media. The trust in the media and the trust in quote unquote the establishment and all that entails is probably at an all-time low and i know that mere awareness is not enough but i would and I, I would so i want to just talk about that as well what this means how people are doing the calculus not only with that immediate visceral response of hey i actually like spending more time with my family and not rushing around like a chicken with its head cut off all day uh, there's so there's that private or personal day-to-day -day aspect but as i said the other balancing factor the other side of that coin is the outward looking, and you were touching on this already, the distrust in the, the narrative and all of that. How, so I'm curious how you factor some of those aspects in, um, and also this might be a good time to touch on accelerationism as well, because certainly there are those among us who look out and see this happening and say, well, we need to do what we can, um, at least we won't say actively, but uh, just uh, ideologically encouraging people or reiterating in their 
Twitter accounts or wherever they have a voice that, hey, this is a good thing. We should be kind of rooting for the collapse, that this is somehow going to collapse the system and all of that. So there, there are a lot of different points there, Jared. Um, I, to go back to the very initial one, this question of um, the private sphere, I think that this is a key point, and I think that it, it really needs to be focused on. Um, I mentioned this kind of um, encroaching uh, attack on the division between the public and the private, and that distinction which is so fundamental to our societies, and which I think all of us just kind of take for granted. Uh, now, there's a way in which that taking for granted is obscuring real questions. I mean, for example, it's absolutely unacceptable for a person to walk into a grocery store without any clothes on. This is a clear example of how there are rules which must be established in order to you know, have a civil and decent society and which force individuals to you know, don certain kinds of garb or to put certain things on their body, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that what we are, what we are seeing here, both on the economic and political level at the very highest echelons and at the, the very personal and private level is a gradual erasure of that distinction between the public and the private uh, to the point that our bodies can no longer be considered as our own private uh, affairs. They are now in the interests of the state, in the interests of the public good, and they can be potentially even changed as a result of that. Um, now, I don't think I even need to mention the various possibilities that are included in this or the various ways in which we've already seen this happen, again, with things like obligatory face masks and things like this. And now I'm mm -hmm. without even going into, you know, calling that into question or anything of the sort. I think that just noting the fact that that has become obligatory in many parts of the world opens enormous questions about this distinction that I'm talking about and about its gradual erasure. Um, this obviously will become enormously more complicated the greater and more um, specific and detailed our technologies become particularly on the medicinal level because if it is acceptable to um, tell human beings that they need to wear face masks or to uh, wash their hands and this has to be done before they can present themselves in public spaces then potentially you know, in terms of principle, the same thing could be said for uh, vaccines, the same thing yeah. could be said for any number of medicines. And all of this has to be very, very carefully guarded. And I think this is, this is another point which returns to what I was saying before about the absolute necessity of us each coming to some very, very clear, or at least very, very willful and, and stubborn view of where we are going to draw the lines around our own lives. Um, because if we don't have that kind of clarity, then those lines are simply going to vanish and we're going to be standing on the void, nothing, air. Um, so that's the first part of your question, Jared. Now, um, moving on from that, um, so I've actually lost the, the second point that you met, that you touched on. You were... It, it was more about the outward look of just distrust in the whole thing. Right, right, exactly. So yes, I mean, there, there is a way in which I think that, again, just the, the universality of, of what's happened and the universality of the rules which have followed upon it um, has forced us each to look at things with, with a greater immediacy. We were all following the news much more closely. Many of us had time for the first time in you know, years and years, potentially, to sit down at a computer or in front of your television or whatever, you know, and to actually follow these things with some degree of attention. Um, so I'm not surprised by the growing awareness that there's a problem or that there's something unsettling um, or that there might be something doubtful about the media or about our authority figures. That, that's, I think it's a very promising sign. I, I agree with you, Jared. It's not sufficient. Um, the simple awareness of these things does not suffice for um, that kind of clarity that I'm talking about our, of our own personal limits. And uh, without that, that sort of willingness to stand up for one's own view of one's life and for one's own you know, rights, to use a very American term. But no, in a more fundamental sense, to stand up for the way that one wishes to live one's life and the way that one feels it is right to live one's life. If we're not willing to do that, then we can have all the awareness of the situation we want, but uh, we're still going to be cascading with increasing velocity into this um, this avalanche, which is going to be increasingly difficult to stop. It has already become very, very difficult to stop. Mm -hmm. um, go ahead, Jared. We had, no, go ahead if you're not done with your... Uh, no, I was, I was finished with that point, so by all means. We had a quick question from the audience that if Arctos has a DLive channel. Has a what channel? 
a D Live channel. It's a newer streaming platform. Ah, there we are. Well, yes, I think that um, my absolute perplexity about what that question was meant to intend um, yeah. has shown so. that there is no such thing as I'm afraid <laughs> that the editor in chief of Arctos is something of a tendential Luddite and has all kinds of difficulties with technology. Um, <laughs> that are much more psychological than practical, but maybe no, we don't have anything you, of the kind. Maybe that's given you a, a unique view on the topic at hand. Let's turn somewhat inward to our own spheres. You have a line, I'll paraphrase, the dissident right thinks in terms of leaps and coups, the globalists in terms of evolution, which do you think has been more effective? Certainly interesting in light of a certain recent events in the beginning of this month here in the United States, but there's something very powerful to explore here. I think the lessons that our side needs to reflect on. So please take the time that you need to expand on that very point. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I guess um, one of the places to begin with this is just to look at the history of the last hundred years and how our societies have unfolded over the course of these hundred years. Now, it is very easy to follow the, now I use the word evolution here in a very loose sense, not in the sense that's attached to Darwinism, but simply as a kind of gradual unfolding. That's the, the, evolution, yeah, the, the actual definition, like the actual coil, meaning is exactly. coiled up and then it uncoils in its natural progression. Precisely right, exactly right. And that's the sort of thing that we've seen in the past hundred years, particularly of our societies, though I think the timeline could be stretched back even further than that, probably to the past half millennium or so. But particularly in this past century, what we have seen is uh, a very, very sophisticated, um, very, very uh, philosophically established and very, very... Uh, resource-oriented attempts to ch radically change the nature of our societies. Uh, it has had a great deal of influence behind it. It has had very, very influential uh, writers and thinkers that have been within it. It has had um, the favor of exceptionally wealthy individuals. All of this has contributed to it, but it has attempted to produce over a long term, which is to say even longer than the lives of individual members of this project which makes it very difficult to see. It has attempted to produce a radical alteration in our societies. Now, it is it, it's very, very easy, I think, to see that kind of a thing and to think immediately, well, this is clearly just a conspiracy theory. This, you know, this sort of thing could never happen. There could not possibly be that sort of an attempt and no, nobody would be interested enough to actually continue something for so long. But I think that it suffices to compare our present day society in this historical moment to our that same society, be it American or European or any country of the West that you want, to a hundred years past and to see the changes that have, that have occurred within the context of those individual nations. And to compare that with the indications that we have on the basis of many books and many writings of many individuals from about a hundred years ago, uh, which indicated this arc of evolution in our societies and indicated the goal toward which we were all moving. We see the same sort of thing today. There are projects that are under um, development in the present moment and that are publicly available for our review, such as Agenda 2030 of the United Nations um, and <clears throat> the, the Great Global Reset, which has become you know, the, the topic of discourse in many, many public circles as of late following the coronavirus, but which is an idea which extends far back into time. Um, any number of things uh, can be traced back to this sort of overarching movement. Now, this was not an attempt to overthrow societies and to replace one regime with another. Um, that was tried, I think, in many parts of the world under a great many auspices and for a great many philosophical reasons. Uh, communism is the clearest, I think, instance of that. But what happened in the West was not uh, a kind of revolutionary movement which jumped up all at once and threw down the government and you know replaced it with another, as we saw, for example, in the French Revolution. We've seen a different kind of approach to political development in recent times. And that approach has been very, very long-term. It has been very, very um, carefully planned in all of its different details and parts with this view, very, very long view in mind. Um, now, 
the success again of that project is visible to us because we are all living within a society which has been in large part produced by it. We might not be following as rigidly as certain people would like the timelines that have been proposed, but we are moving in that direction and we are moving in that direction with increasing speed. The attempt to um, react against this and uh, react against these changes has on the whole, been rather more revolutionary than the changes themselves in the sense that there's been a kind of attempt to simply stop everything, just stop it all at once, you know, standing athwart history, screaming stop and just trying to, you know, make the machine shut down and just stop it where it is, uh, which is impossible with any kind of dynamic system. Or worse yet, it has been an attempt to leap back in time in a moment. Just say, okay, that's enough. We want to overthrow this thing. We want to see a past society reemerge all at once from the ashes of what uh, what has been you know, eliminated or obliterated or destroyed. And we want to do this all at a sweep. We're not patient. We're not going to wait. It's just going to happen now in this moment. Um, there are are many things that condition this kind of response. In part, I think it's actually, you know, just simply a product of the fact that we live in societies in which we expect everything to happen now. Um, so there is that kind of base element to it, which, which is suggestive of a, a lack of adequate reflection on the part of people who suggest this kind of radical and immediate change. On the other hand, I think that there is something about it which is simply based in principle and this, this awareness that if we compromise with modernity, we are liable to lose our souls to it. Um, and I see this particularly in certain traditionalist movements um, and also in certain religious movements. It's something that I can appreciate very much. And I can appreciate particularly the acts of individual human beings who say, I will not participate in this. I'm going to live in a completely different way. I'm going to go into a monastery or I'm going to live on a little personal farm with my family and I'm going to produce my own food or what have you. you know, these, these sorts of responses I can appreciate. And I think that they are very, very sensible. They are admirable in many cases if they're done with the right uh, reasons in mind. But I think that there is a corresponding danger on the wider scale of supposing that society can do the same thing that an individual can do, which is to say to just stand up one day and decide, I'm not going to live like this anymore. I'm going to completely rearrange my social um, structure and my political structure, my economic structure, and I'm going to go back to how the world was 100 or 500 or 1,000 or 2,000 years ago or what have you. That cannot happen. And what the, the, the consequences of that kind of an attempt on any level higher than the, the personal and the individual is inevitably uh, the production of movements which uh, are going to show to the world a very dangerous face. And it's going to be the sort of thing that um, people are going to respond to negatively because it has that kind of revolutionary fervor to it, which we rightly associate with things like the French Revolution or the Communist Revolution. These moments in society in which everything collapsed and what was rebuilt was far worse than what had preceded it. So I, I think that there, there's an element of um, truth to that kind of um, negative reaction to revolutionary fervor. And there's a way in which I think that uh, our response has to take into account the effectiveness of longer term action. Now, having said that, obviously, the caveat is that we are living in a moment in which we don't have 100 years. Um, in 100 years from now, society is going to look so completely different if nothing changes that we won't even recognize ourselves, much less the society in which we're living. We have to act with greater alacrity, with greater speed. So, I mean, recognizing that that is a necessity of our situation, there's a contradiction which is produced by this, and it's very difficult to find one's way out of it. it it's not sufficient to say, we have to overthrow everything now, and it's not sufficient to say, we've got to try to do this long term with a long march through the institutions, changing people's minds over the course of many, many decades. Neither of those approaches is going to work. Um, and I think that this puts us into a moment which can really truly be called a desperate moment. Um, I don't hesitate to use that word. We are living in desperate times. The only thing that we can do, I think, is to try to fall back very, very firmly and very, very completely on that private sphere, on that individual level, uh, which is not to say that we need to break ourselves off from communities and from society as such. It is to say that we need to take almost a kind of stoic approach to this insofar as we recognize that there is nothing we can do in the face of the enormities of wealth 
and the enormities of inertia that have been accumulated in the movements of our societies, broadly speaking. We can change our personal lives. We still have that freedom. We can change the minds of the individuals around us, or at least try to do so. We still have that freedom. We still have our families and our smaller communities, our, the people who live around us, our neighbors, our friends. We have the, the ability to, to discourse with these people, not only to teach them, but also to learn something from them. But in any case, to attempt to arrive with them and with these, these very organic and immediate human connections at a sensible way of approaching things, a kind of life that is worth living, even in the chaos and the wreckage of our modern world, which is only going to become more difficult from here. So we need to begin to focus on that. And the more that we attempt to turn all of our energies toward the level of the political, say electing the right man or you know, getting people to understand that this or that economic system is the proper economic system, these are or can be, in certain cases, valid pursuits, but I do not think that they are going to get us where we need to go, and they're not going to move nearly fast enough to get us where we need to go. We can change things on a personal scale, and we need, I think, to begin to look at that very, very carefully. Um, now, Jared, you also mentioned accelerationism, and I think this would actually be a, a good place to move into that question. I, um, for some years now, actually practically for the entirety of my public career in, in these uh, circles, I have been very skeptical of accept accelerationism. And I think that I'm probably more so today than I was even when I began. Um, I am concerned by it for the very simple reason that the individuals who are attempting to produce the kind of society that accelerationism would want to obstruct or to de destroy are much more powerful than we are. They are vastly more influential than, they, than we are. And they have enormities of wealth at their disposal that we cannot even fathom or dream in many cases. This is personal wealth. This is institutional wealth. We're speaking of people who have such a sphere of control that the proposal of um, uh, attempting to undermine society to the point that it collapses is clearly missing a fundamental point there. <clears throat> Whatever we see as a potential uh, consequence of the fall of society, they have seen with much greater clarity than we have because they have the resources to put into the studies behind it. They have the resources to put into um, all, you know, all manner of predictive uh, tools in order to, to see much more clearly how these things could play out. And they have the leisure in many cases that we lack in order to look at all of these things in the face. Accelerationism always presupposes a number of uh, notions, which to me are simply impossible to presuppose with any kind of confidence. The first of it, either, either we have a case in which our leaders are so blind and they are so um, overcome by just crazy ideologies that they literally cannot see the course of uh, destruction toward which they are leading us. And so they will be caught utterly surprised and um, you know, off their guard when things begin to, to collapse. This has been disproved, though. It's been disproved time and time again. The coronavirus has disproved it. I mean, people have talked about the coronavirus being a black swan event, this utterly unexpected thing. But there were events last year which were preparing on the political, social, economic, global level for a pandemic precisely of this kind. There were two of them in 2019 alone. This was not an unexpected event. I mean, it is easy enough for anyone with a degree of foresight to imagine the possibility of a global pandemic. And it has been imagined and it has been simulated on a broad scale in things like uh, Crimson Contagion from last year, which ran from January to August, Event 201, which by now everyone's heard of, which actually proposed a pandemic of, of a coronavirus in particular. These things have been run through. These people are not going to be caught off their guard. They are aware of the possibilities and they are much better prepared to confront them than we are. Now, the only other thing that the accelerationists can say, I think, is that um, they are overconfident in their ability to manipulate periods of catastrophe or crisis. Uh, in other words, it, if things are pushed to a certain point and a true societal collapse begins to come and the, uh, this is, our political systems really begin to unravel, they will not be able to keep up with the, the turning of the tide and they will fall with the entire superstructure. That is an enormous gamble. And I think that it is one which history calls 
also radically into question, perhaps not so, so near a history as the coronavirus outbreak, but when one looks at the outcome of things like the communist revolution or what generally tends to happen in any kind of societal breakdown, it's not generally speaking a movement from worse to better, not generally speaking, there might be exceptions, but do we want to gamble on the possibility of that kind of an exception when we don't even know with adequate clarity what kinds of preparations have been taken at the highest echelons of our society. In my mind, it would be folly to do so. And I think that accelerationism falls apart for that reason. So I'm hearing continually, and correct me if I'm wrong, I never want to put words in anyone's mouth. Um, a theme you keep returning to is you have, and I say this myself often on this very show, that you really have to look at what you have sovereignty over ultimately. I mean, that is your own life, your own thoughts, your own emotions, and those of those closest to you and around you, how you structure your life, your resources. I love something that Lark Ascending just said in the regular chat. Um, certainly, our many of our religious institutions have been infiltrated or the educational organs that then feed the leaders of such institutions. So these things are, religion and the sacred are not necessarily the same. So I say that as a preamble. Uh, but Lark Ascending simply wrote, they do not control the sacred. And maybe that is what you're talking about, and being the sacred of the day-to-day -day, day -day life. It's a beautiful, a beautiful statement there. I'd like to continue. Of course, you can expand on that. Um, but I would like to make sure we, we're moving along because this is such a rich topic and we want to do your article, The Justice It Deserves. Uh, continuing to speak a little bit about refining, we'll say, our own spheres and some advice for how our anyone who has a voice that's not necessarily content producers all of us are representing this in some way even if you have a twitter account with just a few dozen people um, who knows who that's going to affect who's going to come across that that might be someone's first point of entry into our way of thinking uh, but especially for the content producers and those who do shows or write articles and things you issue a stern warning about lionizing China's response. So we see this in some of our sphere, some of those in our spheres, oh, they have a different idea of the social order. They took an iron fist with this. That's the kind of thing that we need in the West. You do very well to explain, and we don't have to stay on this too long. We do have some more things to get to, but it's worth, it's worth hitting on this note, at least for a moment. The Western statesman is not who he used to be, and I'll quote another wonderful passage from your article, for the fingers that grab for this gift are far from likely in our day to be attached to virtuous hearts. So we could just touch on that for a moment before we move on. There is, I think, a kind of um, authoritarian bent which sometimes comes out in our sphere. Um, and one can understand why it does so. It, it comes from a lot of different sources and some of these sources are kind of mutually contradictory. Uh, there's a sort of Nietzschean strand, I think, in many parts of what we could call the dissident right today, or uh, even just kind of, you know, contra uh, protest against modernity. And this Nietzschean strand tends toward uh, a kind of valorization of authority as such or power as such. Um, there's also another way in which traditionalism obviously indicates the need to reclaim in some sense a legitimate center of authority within society in order to um, produce the kind of natural hierarchies and structures uh, for which um, we are all of us in some way lusting in our day, even if it be in unconscious ways. Um, so, I mean, these are various different strands. I think that... Um, Generally speaking, it can be said that whatever one might think about power and authority and hierarchy, and I, for one, am very much for all three of them in the proper context. Today, we are living in a very, very strange and debilitated and in many ways sick world. And in the context of that world, there are certain ideas which I think are much more valid um, specifically and locally than they would be for humanity as such. For example, Lord Acton's famous pronouncement that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, with which I, dis I, mean, I, I disagree strongly with this as a principle. But in our day and time, I think there's some truth to it because we live in a world in which we have systems which are developed in order to produce a kind of inverted... Um, uh, 
inverted screening for, in some cases, even the worst among us to, to cause them to rise to the top. So in a context like that, in which we have these sorts of institutions which are perverse from the very bottom up, these views actually do have a, a, a degree of validity. And I think liberalism as a general principle needs to be comprehended within the context of that. There's something to be said even for the libertarian position in our time. Did all of my disagreements, my profound disagreements with it apart, at least they're standing for something which I think could help us in a number of ways. <clears throat> now, um, having said all of that, I think that the real point here is that we simply have to be aware of the time in which we're living and of the consequences of importing good ideas from a healthy time into a sick time. Um, China is a clear example of this. I, I think that one could, in many cases, point to places like North Korea or China or communist Cuba or what have you and say, they've done this right. They got that right and we got it wrong. I'm not adverse to that kind of thinking. I'm not proposing a binary scheme by which the West is correct and the, these other parts of the world are wrong. What I am proposing is that whatever they might have gotten right, they are still enormously uh, tyrannical and totalitarian governments. They are based on a, a techni technocratic vision of things. They are power hungry in the worst sense, and the individuals who are ruling them are not by any means the sorts of you know noble souled aristocrats that one might wish. Having said all of that, then I mean the, the obvious conclusion from this is that it is simply um, a, a non-starter to attempt to find that nation in the world that's gotten it right and to follow it and to say that that's you know that that place has it right we have it wrong let's do what they're doing we have to recognize that this sickness uh, of our societies and our political systems is global affects all the nations of the world and has to be um, addressed very very specifically in terms that make sense in our time rather than in some other time Well said, I want to continue riffing on this theme of refining and helping our own sphere be more discerning. Um, and it flows naturally from what you're just talking about. And that's this idea of hot takes, baby. You got to have the hot takes right, to stay in the right. game, right? So, well, we have a lot of groupthink, let's be honest. Um, for those, all the auspices of this wider sphere, not necessarily this particular community here, the pristine community for white well-being, <laughs> but uh, the, the general sphere, and we all inter interface with other people in this sphere. So while it might not be about most of the people listening now, we all are still in this together. We are part of a wider sphere and we do have influence. So I say this not only about content creators like the three of us up here, but any any of us, uh, please do think of the, the chat community as you address this, who can maybe help guide some of our other voices to be a little more discerning and, and critique them in proper ways. On the one hand, uh, we have a very sometimes limited scope, let's admit it, of memes and tropes that are acceptable. Uh, there are a lot of things that people just spew out. They did cursory research on, maybe they watched a few videos, maybe a documentary, maybe right. read a few articles, and then they think their worldview is locked because is the acceptable thing to say in our sphere, it curries favor, it gets you social acceptance. On the other hand, there's that side of the, the hot take, the novelty take, and Jason has spoken a lot about this, where we see sometimes people saying something outrageous or totally counter to the assumptions and the values of, again, our general spheres, just to kind of stand out. So do you have anything to say about, again, encouraging and, and correctly critiquing, doing it in the right way, doing it in a, in a noble, you know, high mannered way. But uh, we all have a part in this. There's all of this is a feedback loop. I know that you were talking about the fact that in some ways you, you can never really have an analog online for in real life community. And that certainly well point well taken, but we are still part of a social sphere here. We live in the day and age of the internet. And we are still giving each other social signals and feedback loops and, and positive and negative uh, rewards, social rewards, I guess you could say, in that regard. So it's a big task. <laughs> and I'm not saying we're going to uh, rein everyone in, but how do we keep that focus, but at the same time, make sure that we're not getting lost in, in uh, this kind of paint by numbers 
way to see the world or that opposite extreme I mentioned the novelty take. So in the first place, I would like to qualify my remarks on community. Um, I, I do think that the dangers that I proposed in our contemporary sense of community are real and need to be deeply investigated and considered. At the same time, I, I certainly do not mean to call into question ventures like yours. To the contrary, um, you know, I'm very, very pleased to be speaking to you, Jason and, and Jared, for, the, for this particular conversation because it's so pertinent to what you are doing and what you do so very well, which is community building in a true and legitimate sense. You are making honest, uh, deep connections with one another despite distances, despite this kind of utterly artificial medium in which we are um, forced to, to uh, correspond in these days. And you're doing so in a way which proves, it demonstrates the validity of that pursuit and the importance of that pursuit. So having said that, I mean, I think that you absolutely should be complimented and saluted for, your, for what you've done here. And I would not in any way call that into question, uh, nor did I mean to with my remarks uh, previously. Um, now, never, never took it that way. We never took it. No, that no. Way. I just I'm clarifying more for the sake of anyone who's listening. But I, I'm I'm sure that you know where I stand with regard to your very good work. Um, so now the question that you've broached is uh, again very multifaceted. It touches, I think, very much on the nature of our societies at present and the way that we are all um, both accustomed, but even uh, almost conditioned, um, I, I would even go so far as to say programmed, using that word in all of its terrible implications. We are programmed to um, respond to things in a certain way. Uh, we are programmed to go to our computers every day or to our televisions every day and to check the news and to see what's happened so that we have exactly, you know, we're up to date, we can speak about these things in an intelligent way. Um, there's a kind of even honorable basis to this in an older style of uh, classic liberalism, which you know has it that citizens have to be well informed if they're going to be able to make um, intelligent and uh, sensible political decisions. And so it's necessary for them to follow things like current events. But we've become addicted to it. I mean, it has become something which has taken an absolute precedence in our lives. This is compounded in its hazard by the fact that the sources of our information are either on the one hand deliberately misleading and um, in many cases uh, deceitful, and then on the other hand, in many cases radically incomplete or working from a uh, you know, very, very small amount of uh, money and resources with a very, very limited staff. So the alternative media, media has a number of different problems that confront it that it has to face and they can compromise in many, many cases, the quality of the information that it presents. Whereas the mainstream media is uh, so well known in our circles and it's uh, general way of being that I need not even touch upon that. Um, and we're caught in the middle of this, attempting to find some way forward so that we know what's happening. We can speak about it intelligently and competently, and we don't get lost in uh, this just continual progression of events. A word of caution is due here. I think that we are entering into a new phase in which we are going to see a kind of non-stop and continual crisis. We are entering a kind of constant emergency situation. I think this is only going to grow more acute, but 2020 has provided a good sampling of what we, we can expect in the future. There's one thing after another, which is absolutely you know, horrendous and it's on all the headlines of all the newspapers and all of the press uh, gurus and pundits are speaking about it. And we've got to pay attention because it's, you know, threatening our society or it's bringing forth our inner contradictions or what have you. This kind of crisis thinking is very, very dangerous because it, it, it harms us in our ability to sit back and to consider events from a distance, from a point of, from a position of leisure, using that word in its original and vital and true sense, and to try to get some handle on things which is not pressed by the very, very latest news or the very, very latest event. I think that it, it would be well for us to take periods of fasting from our gorging of the media, you know, just to sit back for even as long as a week, if not maybe even in some cases a month, and just stop reading these things. Stand back and stop reading them, and then come back to it and see just how much of all of that was important enough that you needed to know at the time.
I can and personally I think, attest to that. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I've tried that experiment as well, and I was very interested by the uh, by the results. Generally speaking, I think it's safe to say that any kind of news which is going to be important enough for us to know on an absolute we must know about it, is going to encroach itself on our personal lives in one way or another. The coronavirus is a case of that. So, I mean, we're, we're approaching a point in time in which these crises can even be changed or, or generalized past their real import to the point that they will touch all individuals regardless of how much of a true crisis they are. So that's that's another danger to look out for in all of this. But one way or another, I think we, we have to find that right di distance. It's a very difficult balance to strike between being serious about what's happening in the world, being willing to look at these things as closely and in as much detail as we can in order to speak intelligently and competently on them, and at the same time not being so caught up in this just continual flux and this continual torrent of information that we get lost in it. Um, or worse yet, that we are actually channeled by it, by individuals who know what they're doing, channeled by it in specific directions, which are contrary to the way that we would actually wish to go. Right, so that's, that's a word of caution. Now, about the question of <clears throat> what we can as individuals do. I think that this comes back in large part to what I was saying before about the necessity of opening channels of communication with individuals who do not agree with us and doing so just with as much patience as we can muster in cases where it might be difficult to do so because it's fundamental to us. We are human beings. We are limited. We do not have the truth. We can move toward it through contact with other human beings, through discussing things, conversing, talking about things not just with people who might have variances of opinion here or there, but with people who are radically opposed to us. This is what Socrates did with his entire life. He went around looking for people who disagreed with him as profoundly as possible. He called them touchstones of the soul. These are individuals who could show him whether his soul was gold or not. We need to look for that. This crisis has cut the legs out from underneath us in that respect, particularly in the earlier months, but in some parts of the world, even to this day, um, and in many cases, in many venues and um, you know, isolated realities to this day, absolutely, it has eliminated or reduced or attempted to assault the possibility that we have for that kind of real human contact. We have got to reassert its centrality in our, in our lives. Um, and I think that this is one way of approaching the problem that you point to, Jared. It's very easy for people to get caught up in, uh, as you point out, in any number of um, you know, hot takes, as you put it, right? They, they go online and they see what's happening and they read this report or they read that report. They don't have the time necessary in many cases to read every report because none of us has that kind of time except for the people who dedicate their lives to it. And even they are hard pressed to follow all of this. So they take that very limited and partial information and they run with it. <clears throat> and in many cases it's valid and in many cases it's not valid. It's actually false. And they, they present that information as if it were true. And the problem of course, is that it reflects badly on the entire community because then you have an individual who is presenting things that are very easily debunked. Uh, things that you know present verifiable falsity, falsities to the world at large. And so it's it's, you know, all it takes is somebody to point a finger at that person and say, look, there we have it. There's our conspiracy cook. And that's it. It's closed. Um, they're all like that over there. Now, that doesn't mean that we all have to just shut up and be quiet and obedient and meek and uh, stop talking about these things. The contrary is true. We, we have to be as serious about them as we can be. And we have to present our views on these things uh, with as much background and as much support as we can it might be worth our while to try experimenting with a number of different approaches to this. Rather than reading the report and going out and publishing something on your blog or going out into the, the comment section of you know, YouTube or some other social network and presenting this view as if it were God's own truth, it might be best to step back um, recognizing you don't have the time to go out and read every source or to you know, verify every single source, but to step back with that and to confront it as God intended with other individual human beings on a one-to-one -one basis, say, look, this is what I've found. Let's talk about this. There are, I mean, there are fortunately enough people who are still reasonable enough to do that. And to try to... That's one of my favorite... Yeah, it, it really, I mean, it's, it's indispensable. It's indispensable. 
It's great. That's why I do this show. I, I learned doing this show. I don't, I'm not up here because right. I think I know everything. I've learned a lot doing this show and talking to our amazing guests and learning with Jason as well. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I, I think that we're, in a certain way, we're all in it for that because anyone who is involved in our sphere is clearly, um, has clearly arrived at such a point in his life or else has just a kind of natural tendency in the direction of um, looking at things critically, looking at things from a point of view which is not merely conventional and attempting to arrive at uh, a kind of verifiable or true foundation to life. It is uh, an absolutely noble attempt. It's easy to get carried away in all of the fuss and bother of our, uh, you know, our contemporary uh, chaos and to just be you know, carried away on that wave into some far distant place from where we began without even recognizing how we got there. Uh, we need to cultivate self-reflection and the best way of cultivating self-reflection is through real conversations um, in which we are not aiming for victory, but we are aiming for truth. Uh, and it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to recapture in our day and age. And I think that it's been made difficult very deliberately in many cases, unfortunately. But we, we have to try to recapture that. If we do that, I think that it will be easy for easier for us to then come with renewed confidence in what we have found and in the validity of what we have found, knowing you know, with a greater degree of, of um, uh, confidence what is true and what is false, and to present that on a wider a wider kind of uh, medium like comment feeds or like, um, you know, pr private blogs and all of these things. And at that point, there's there's a degree, I mean, there is, it becomes a kind of different <clears throat> rapport that one is seeking because in many cases, one is also attempting to present that view to the world in a, a compelling manner. But that has to be the thing that follows from the initial gesture toward attempting to find the truth. It cannot be the substitute for that. So we have several more notes on this wonderful article. And again, if someone, especially I'll say this for the record, is listening in the replay, of course, on our website, theafterparty.tv, we will link to John's sweeping article about the world under the plague. Um, so even though we have several more notes, hopefully, perhaps some of those notes can be woven into any questions from the community that we're going to get to in a moment um, that Jason might have been collecting during this time. So having said that, I'm just going to end on one last formal question for you from our list before we open it up to some of the other questions and maybe perhaps work in some of the notes. But again, it's a very it's an article with a very wide scope. So even if we don't get to that, I think we've already provided a lot of food for thought, a feast really. Um, I wanna just give you an opportunity to go back to something that you insinuated before, but you also set up very nicely in the comments you just uh, wrapped up. And that is, it would appear that our ethos and our values, looking big picture, looking at systems, and that's a lot of what you're doing in this article, steps entirely outside of the assumptions and the paradigm itself of what we call modernity. You said towards the beginning of this show that if you really wanna take it far back, we can at least trace it to maybe the last four or five centuries we know mercantilism started pretty much around 1600 uh, and banking making moves to kind of usurp throne and alter and the old monarchies. It took a few hundred years, but by the latter half of the 19th century, we saw those European monarchies falling apart, setting the stage for the kind of secular order we have now, postmodernism, war on truth, all of that. There are political aspects, economic aspects, spiritual, religious aspects. It's tremendous in scope, of course. Um, but you taught, you were speaking about engaging with others, uh, which I agree with, but the task at hand that we have is both for our own, we were talking about the private sphere, sovereignty over your own life. So what does this look like when you step outside modernity, both for the choices you make for you and your family, and also how you confront these other people out there who are swimming around in the assumptions of modernity. We know we are a minority. Now, we focus, uh, Jason's work, of course, is laser focused on this issue at hand that because we're of European descent, only we can address. It's made or, made or broken by us, which is the attacks on our people. But that, that's still what made that possible to begin with is under this larger umbrella 
of these assumptions of modernity to begin with. So again, the private sphere, what this looks like to a man and his family stepping outside of modernity, but also how we interface with the 95% of people out there uh, who may be willing to some degree to have a, an honest dialogue with us, but are, as it were, somewhat speaking a different language because we are some of the only people who are seriously questioning the paradigm of modernity as such. The onus is on us, I think, in any kind of context in which we are confronting an individual who uh, is of a conventional mindset or who uh, adheres to the modern project. The onus is on us because we are living within that modern society. We are the exceptions. We are not the rule. We are the ones who have to make that forward effort. Um, we are likely to be simply negated or uh, denied in our attempts in many cases. And we, we well know this. There are people who are simply closed-minded and will not listen to what we have to say. You point to the uh, the cases which are really of interest to us, which are individuals who are not utterly closed to us and to whom there might be some possibility of uh, bringing a difference of view. Now, we have an advantage in this because having broken with modernity, we have at least a, a fairly complete intuition of what modernity means and what our alternative means. Uh, we have that in mind. The person who is simply within the sphere of modernity, within that kind of closed uh, system of views and of uh, presuppositions and of suggestions, very often has no clear idea of what we're talking about. To the contrary, they very often have these caricatures floating in their mind, which have been produced very carefully, these stereotypes which have been produced very carefully in order to paint us in a certain way so that we come across as being crazy or um, ignorant or stupid or what have you. There are any number of characterizations possible. That is the barrier that we have to break. It is not simply a barrier of, uh, of ideas. Um, in terms of ideas, you know, we would not be here if we did not think that our ideas were stronger than the ideas which are presented as the modern um, status quo. But it is not sufficient to produce the intellectual support for those ideas. We have to find a way of breaking through that much more basic barrier which stands between us and them and which prohibits them from stepping outside of their sphere. Now, it is not guaranteed that in stepping outside of their sphere and even seeing with some degree of clarity our views, they will, they will for that reason, convert to our position. That is not guaranteed by any means. But that's not of concern to us. What is a basic concern to us is presenting ourselves in such a manner that that point of dialogue becomes possible. And I think that that's going to demand from us things that we probably haven't been uh, focusing on as much as we, we could have in recent years. Things like patience, things like uh, empathy even, in an attempt to understand how it is that somebody could find themselves believing things that we find to be ridiculous or abhorrent in many cases. Now, there are individuals who believe those things because they are ridiculous or abhorrent individuals. That's a case aside. Most people are not like that. Most people have decency to them. And if we honestly believe that we're coming at this from a, a perspective of you know, pro providing a better kind of world view, then we have to find that point of contact to show those individuals what it is that we think is so good about our worldview. It has to be a positive act. It cannot simply be a negative and destructive and critical act. Um, it cannot be, it is never enough to simply say, your views are wrong for uh, X, Y, and Z. These reasons here, you um, have these inner contradictions in your worldview and it, it cannot stand. That's not sufficient. Um, it's not sufficient because it puts people on the defensive. And when they get on the defensive, they simply uh, redouble their, their belief in their own positions. They find new ways of defending themselves, in many ways very, um, very imaginative ways of defending themselves. The challenge that is in front of us is presenting the positive aspects of our view in such a way as to make that accessible and uh, even desirable to other, other people who might be having some real doubts about the way the world is moving, particularly in the present moment. And it is not, it is not easy to do that. It's not easy to break through that. Um, but I think that it can be done by better understanding what it is that has 
drawn us to our present position and why it is that we were compelled to move in this direction. In many cases, it might simply be because the argument was stronger, but we have to recognize that that's not sufficient for many people, and many people will simply close down to intellectual debate of that kind. Um, the conversation has to be a human conversation. It has to be something which is makes a real connection between us and that other person, despite those differences. We have to try to find that portion of, of common ground between us and them. And it exists insofar as we are all human beings with a basic nature. The individuals who don't share in that basic human nature are so exceptional that we don't need to consider them in any way. They are going in a completely different way right now. And, uh, and in many cases, that's exactly what we're trying to combat. So <clears throat> we have to find that basic human ground and work from that. Um, and I think that you know, in our broader effort to clarify, articulate, and present our position with respect to the modern world. We only have a couple of different possibilities. Um, one is the, the kind of critical view, which looks at that modernity and says, these are the problems with it. These are the problems with its foundations. These are the individuals who have put it forth, and this is why their philosophies were wrong, et cetera, et cetera. There is a revolutionary view, which says, this is absolutely disgusting. We've got to blow it up and replace it with something else. And then there is uh, the traditional view, which is to say that we are in a state of absolute crisis on a, a level which has never before been seen. We are being led in ways directly contrary to our basic humanity. Something has to be done. And the only way that we're going to find any kind of legitimate anchor in this world is by turning toward traditions, which are much older and much wiser than we are. Now, um, I think that there are tendencies in all of these directions within our sphere. There is the reactionary tendency, <clears throat> which is kind of a mix between the cr critical and the revolutionary. It has its, its validity. It has its reason for its raison d'etre, but it's not going to take us where we need to go. Uh, there, is a, there are many attempts to produce a kind of new philosophy or something that can take us radically out of this in a, in a fundamental movement of progress forward. I would contest that this is nothing but modernity again. It is simply repeating the same error in which we are all living. And um, I have yet to see even a single compelling case of that kind of, of a solution leading us in a way which is healthier than what we are seeing at present. And then there is the traditional approach, trying to find our roots. These can be spiritual. These can be roots to the sacred or to the religious. They can be roots going back to uh, the history of our peoples. They can be ethnic roots. All of these things, all of these facets of our beings have to be uh, brought forth in this kind of traditionalist uh, retro movement. And I think that that's where our, our focus has to be. Very, very well stated. What a magnificent discussion we have had here tonight. I have been enraptured from the very beginning as soon as I stopped talking. <laughs> it was a very interesting conversation. John has uh, given us, ladies and gentlemen, a pellucid diagnosis of what is going on in the world. Anti-whiteism in its effects, where the rubber meets the road, affecting all of our lives, families and societies. And I think uh, in many ways, uh, absolutely buttressing all of the pragmatic steps that we now take. There were a number of topics over the course of the night. And I'll just say quickly while you are, are uh, listening to what I have to say, that uh, we're in the final moments of the show tonight. It, you, If you have any questions or comments, please make them now. Tag me and Mr. George over on, uh, over on the uh, No White Guild channel. It looks like uh, I might be out of sync a little bit, my audio, and I apologize for that if that's the case. Uh, some people are saying that in the chat. And or, and or you can be over on Discipline uh, Channel with NWG, and you can tag me as uh, Discipline with NWG over there, and I will see it. Of course, we have Entropy as we are wrapping up here tonight, and the Financially Gift there, and the Financially Gift on Cash App if you would like to do that. But there were a number of things tonight that uh, we discussed that were... I thought were really just pertinent for the things that are going on uh, right now. Is it, I really liked the uh, the mention of the fasting from the news and all this this endless litany. Exactly as we predicted, by the way, that 2020 would be a big uptick and it would be the first decade. I mean, the first year of the decade where there would be a regular uptick every year 
of the anti-whites getting stronger, but also us getting stronger. And this endless, these endless crises and ex exigencies just from one day to the next. Instead, and, and folks getting sort of drunk on it or preoccupied with it. It's like the shiny, uh, balled up aluminum foil for, you know, like the monkey at the zoo. And he just, he can't get his eyes off it. He wants to play more with the aluminum foil uh, instead of doing the work that we need to be doing on a daily basis. And this uh, connects to the other issue. And the, wor the work, by the way, that we need to be doing on a daily basis is promulgating, going free, uh, ourselves, treating ourselves for the mean pathogens that we are infected with and helping our family next and then going out to the broader community so that we can make a people out of this deracinated race while there is still time to do so. And folks that are saying in the live chat about, well, it doesn't matter whether whether Trump or Biden, uh, you, you all are absolutely wrong. This, you know, this, uh, you have to vote for Trump for what he won't do. Biden is gonna take away, if you haven't seen the Biden Sanders plan, if you haven't looked at that, I think I'll talk about that on Sunday. Everything will be gone that you rely on now to be able to resist in any way that you think you can. Everything that you thought was beyond the pale or beyond possible, they will immediately implement. Biden has the plans laid out. And if it doesn't take place, if Biden doesn't get into office now, it will be taking place four years from now. We need this time uh, to spread going free to as many people as we can so that this curative contagion can influence the lives of our brothers and sisters, even when these anti-whites begin to take what is truly Procrustean, forget about draconian, what is truly Procrustean steps uh, to uh, implement a tyranny that will prevent us from even being able to breathe, much less uh, resist anti-whiteism and the harm that it does on our children and our people. Uh, so I thought that was fantastic. The novelty takes where we talked about uh, these, these sort of extraneous, uh, uh, tangential, really digressive, that word really fits it better. These sort of digressive uh, ideas that take us in directions that are very interesting. And then we, we've we been talking about that. And uh, John, I don't know if you know, we've been talking about that over the past couple of weeks. I've gotten actually very angry over the people. I didn't name any names yet, but next time this happens, I will be naming people uh, that came up with these outrageous predictions that the cities would be uh, quarantined. You wouldn't be allowed to leave any of the uh, major American cities. They would be they would be blocking everybody in, and uh, the borders. The Democrats would 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 uh, close the borders so that because the disease was just going to be so rampant. And all of these people that could have spent the past three months without work, promulgating going free, leafleting in their neighborhoods where it's legal to do so over the course of the night. Uh, and getting on message boards, reaching out, using their their own dollars that the government gave back to them, uh, instead of buying freezer after freezer and pounds upon pounds upon pounds of meat and and toilet paper and the rest, they could have been using that time to change the world that we are in. And this is something that we talk about. And John just beautifully mentioned it toward the end of of his discussion that the onus is on us. We take the responsibility to change the world that we are in. And that's the only way you are going to change the life that you have to live. You're not gonna be able to change that life by buying a freezer and food and toilet paper. You're going to change that life by getting out into the world and spreading going free, the psychological defense for the psychological warfare that is waged against us. Uh, if you buy the toilet paper and the freezers and the rest, society will continue to burn down and they will eventually come for every one of you. The, the final thing I'll say before I start reading from these questions for, for you, John, and uh, the financial gifts we have is that we talk about it, from particle physics, you have the Higgs field. And right now in this theory that we're working on, uh, obviously Western kind, working on proving now as, as possible, the reason why particles have their mass is the interaction of the particles inside of the Higgs field. And you can kind of imagine it the same way you would imagine a, a big fat swimmer. Uh, that person has a more difficult time moving through the water. That's the field in that sense. That's the analogy to the Higgs field. And then you have a sleek swimmer who, who goes through the water quite easily, less mass uh, for such a swimmer by way of the interaction of that field. We have to change the field in which the conversation takes place. And we change that field through concepts like anti-white 
We change that field through concepts like white well-being. And then the anti-whites have to act and carry out their aggression against us inside of that field. And when they do, they are forced to reveal very ugly objectives that the broad sweeping uh, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of our brothers and sisters out there are going to find too objectionable to tolerate anymore. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, every time that you think that we're finished and there's no hope, all you need to do is look at the fact that they continue to propagandize all of those tens of millions, hundreds of millions. They wouldn't bother if there was no hope. They know that there's a superior strength out there to the, this anti-white regime. And it's in all of those people out there, white people with normal sensibilities that are ready to come over and think in a way that will protect them and therefore their children and all of us, uh, if only we can get to them and present it and at the same time purge the people from the white positive sphere, those who are working with us at least, who continue to imitate and uh, present themselves to the world as the ne'er-do-well in the anti-white narrative. All of the old slogans, the old systems. And this is another thing that John said that I thought was brilliant. And it is the inappropriate application of healthy uh, standards or mechanisms in an unhealthy age. You're not going to be able to take something from another that worked well in another age and pluck it out of that age and then dip it into this age and think that it will have the same outcome. I can guarantee you all this. The great leaders that you look, look at uh, in history and you say, that man, he knew exactly how to do it. This guy, he knew exactly what he was doing. Uh, and uh, if that person were in charge, we'd have no problem today. Well, I will tell you this, all of those people that you look at, all of these great heroes from the past, they would do it entirely differently from the way they did it back then because they're in a different milieu here. They would not attempt even remotely to do the things the way they did and succeed in the ways they did in those times in the current situation. So another brilliant uh, and pellucid diagnosis by John, and we're so grateful to have him here. We'll have to have him back a little bit more regularly. Mr. George and I were talking about that and uh, to give uh, the, such diagnoses uh, for our community. And what's, this is the folks, this video, I just and I am going to share a little bit of my displeasure and disgust. This this show that we're doing right now and this video after it is being you know being watched in replay. This should be the kind of if you're going to have a deep dive kind of a conversation. This should be the one that has the 50,000 views. This should be the one that has the 100,000 views. It shouldn't be these other ones with you know the people wearing the ascots or whatever and and starting off silly and and then they they come up with some sort of bizarre novelty take that is totally inappropriate and inapplicable and in no way can be used to serve or inform the pragmatic steps that we take to recapture our destiny those people should be ignored by this community you should mock the people who watch them you should mock the people who continue to give them their time and, and continue to discuss their idiotic subject matter that they then go out and they ruin their, their reputations on. Remember, there is a reputational investment when you repeat the things that people say, you're, these content leaders, there's a reputational investment. And if you say something quirky or dorky or idiotic or, cons or something that is just uh, is wild conspiracy theory type of nonsense, uh, you know, there is no verisimilitude in the things that they're saying, even if in some parallel universe it might be true, which they're not. Even if you then go to your family members and friends and you repeat that sort of nonsense, and then they never listen to anything you have to say again. John mentioned it perfectly when he said, ah, there's the there's the quack, there's the kook from the, uh, from the white positive sphere. Now I've identified them and I'm not going to listen to the next thing they have to share with us. So those were just fantastic things. Those are some of my thoughts. We have some questions. The very first question, John, uh, for you tonight occurred very on by uh, one of our very own hardworking lady in the white positive sphere, uh, Althea on Twitter. And she just asked a general question about your views, if I guess you have any, on identitarian Catholicism. Any views on identitarian Catholicism? I've spent a lot of time considering Catholicism um, as deeply as I'm able. And uh, I would say in the first place that with my concluding remarks from before, uh, the emphasis needs to be placed on living traditions in our time. 
I very much regard Catholicism as a living tradition in our time. It is visibly connected to the past, to the deep past. <clears throat> it has a very, very clear and um, uh, in, in many ways unbroken uh, line, lineage from you know, very, very early times to the present moment. And I personally believe that it bears a great deal of wisdom in that lineage, um, particularly for those individuals who have been uh, brought up within the Catholic tradition. I think that uh, it makes eminent good sense to attempt to deepen that understanding. Now, Catholicism in, in a present moment, I, I think it would be irresponsible to deny is in a very, very difficult time, as is, I think, just about every living tradition that one might touch upon. Uh, Catholicism has been subjected to a great many tendencies which are very visibly modern and anti-Catholic, um, and in many other cases, simply tendencies which do not consider Catholicism at all and simply would go their own way, whether Catholicism existed or not, and to that extent can be regarded as being un-Catholic. Um, now, that, of course, presents a grave difficulty to anyone who is within the Catholic Church. And I think that that difficulty, can there are parallels to it, again, with any of the, the living, particularly religious traditions of our time. Um, the response to that difficulty, I do not believe it would be a, a kind of, uh, should be a kind of... Uh, <clears throat> immediate uh, and knee-jerk uh, movement away from the church. It should rather be an attempt to understand exactly where things went wrong, what's going awry with the church today, and what valid elements exist within the church, because there are valid elements within the church, both in terms of individuals within it and in terms, obviously, of its history and tradition. And it's, it's just incredibly rich, aesthetic, intellectual, philosophical, theological uh, basis that should not be denied. And I think that um, the, the importance of it is rendered perfectly ev evident by the fact that it has been so uh, strongly and concentratedly attacked by the forces of modernity. The forces of modernity for the past 500 years have regarded the church as an enemy to the very progress that I personally stand against. To that extent, the church is clearly a valid element on that field of battle and should be supported to them to the extent that it still represents a bastion for those principles which i believe it does despite all the difficulties that it is confronting very well said brother now let's get jump over to some of these financial gifts we started off the night with our dear and wonderful participant df financially gifting 30 dollars. thank you so much good lady uh, what a wonderful woman here uh, show after show supporting white well-being and uh, doing uh, other uh, behind the scenes things supporting white well-being so thank you so much financial gift thirty dollars and rights here to get the ball rolling gentlemen that was right at the very beginning of the show thank you so much we have one five six viewer financially gifting three dollars and right Pol Pot's year zero is the global reset Stalinist style political correction Mao Zedong constant turmoil or cultural revolutions. The only thing they haven't done yet is mass murder. Thank you very much for the financial gift. And John, any thoughts on 156 viewers uh, statement there? There are eerie parallels between the present state of affairs and um, the events that this person narrates. And I think that those parallels should be very carefully kept in mind. Um, we are in a point of, uh, we are in, in a crucial point, I think is the way, of, the easiest and the simplest way of putting it. We are at a historical moment in which everything is going to change one way or another in the very near future. We are going to see just incredibly fast and incredibly radical changes in the course of this decade. And it might happen that it comes even faster than that. It might be a matter of years rather than an entire decade. Um, Mm -hmm. Where we are going with that is obviously an enormous open question, but the fact that we have moved with such swiftness from the position that we were in even eight months ago, the beginning of this year, you know, the end of last year, um, indicates just how rapidly we can move further on in the kind of very, very troubling prospect that, that uh, 
this this contributor indicates. I think that it, you know, it, I'm, I'm very worried about the future for, the, for that reason precisely. Um, I, I don't anticipate we're going to see any mass murder anytime soon, but I think that, you know, in many ways, what we have seen with our contemporary society is a refinement and um, a sublimization of many of the techniques that were used in places like communist Russia, in places like uh, communist China, in places like you know, Pol Pot's regime and things like that. They have been refined to the extent that they are no longer going to be standing people up, up against a wall and shooting them, but they're not going to be doing that because they won't have to with the techniques right. that they're going to be employing. And so we have to we have to look very carefully for the subtle ways in which we are being moved in that kind of a direction. And they're not going to be as evident as they were in the past. In many cases, they will be. We've seen that this year, but there are many ways in which they will be very subtle and we've got to be aware of what's happening. Yeah, precisely. I agree completely with that. We have a financial gift from another great participant going free, 10 pounds from Lark Ascending. Thank you so very much for those 10 pounds and writing here, Kip which means keep it Promethean. Absolutely. Thank you so much for those 10 pounds. And we'll turn over here to the live chat. And I have a, a statement slash question from Sovereign Erie. Thoughts on Patriot Front? It's a great street activist movement. Also, thoughts on the danger of the Federal Reserve and how they are, and then refers to them in a way that I, uh, I a collective confederation of sorts I will, I will implement. Uh, those words instead, because we don't want to walk into the conspiracy theory, even if it is uh, real. Uh, we don't want to walk into the conspiracy theory field because uh, videos can be deleted for that sort of thing. So first, I'll just I, I'll quickly say, and then I'll pass it over to John. Uh, the uh, I, I've mentioned recently all about Patriot Front. I there are positives. I like the uh, the desire to get out there and to put up banners. Uh, they I think they could use uh, infinitely a better verbiage. Uh, dialectics and lexicon on those banners, but I like the energy to get out, put up banners, put up leaflets, that sort of thing. And I absolutely reject and I call on them to immediately their leadership. And if you're a member of the group, call on the leadership immediately to put an end to these group uh, fight training. That is that is part of the group. If you are in Patriot Front and you want to get a buddy who's in Patriot Front or two, and you guys want to go to the gym, you want to work out, you want to get in the ring and uh, and work on your your fighting skills just in case someone ever attacks you and your wife or your children you're ready to do that then do that but this is totally misplaced you look exactly like the antagonist and the anti-white narrative when you have this group fight training and most importantly that is the video footage those will be the discussions that they will read to the grand jury and then to the jury who will put you away in jail for a very long time they will say the organization's intent is not to spread love and redemption as we are doing here and going free but the organization's intent is to be violent so even if you if you are part of patriot front and you end up somewhere and you are physically assaulted and you are well within your rights to physically defend yourself, you are going to be treated as though you went there looking to harm someone because that's what your organization does. And that is the that was the purpose of the visit to whatever it might be, maybe to stand outside of a, a statue somewhere. And as far as the Fed Reserve goes, uh, they are infinitely powerful because they have the wealth, uh, they have the ability to print the money that they want and the, the people behind that, it's, uh, it's something that we have, I saw the other day, John, and I'll just throw it over to you, this, this comment that, uh, and of course it was made by a very young person, so this young person cannot be blamed for making the comment. But the, the adult who agreed uh, demonstrated some real uh, neoteny uh, in, their, in their dotage, and that is that all we need to do is just take over the media and we win. Well, all we need to do is just take over the Fed Reserve and we win. I mean, this is uh, this is naivete in the extreme. And uh, what can we do? We have to work within exactly as John was just saying a little earlier. We have to work within this this structure that this prison, this matrix prison that we are inside of. There's no getting out of of that, uh, and there is no just 
I tell you, if, if you want to start printing money to compete with the Federal Reserve, you're going to go away for a very long time. But I'll pass it over to John to get his thoughts on Patriot Front and if he has just any general thoughts about the uh, Federal Reserve. Certainly. So um, as far as Patriot Front goes, I am only remotely familiar with them and would not feel comfortable commenting at any depth on them. So I will willingly defer to uh, Jason's assessment of the situation, which sounds to me extremely sensible. More broadly speaking, I do think that there is a great deal to be said for these kinds of um, grassroots community movements that seek to uh, form, you know, what might be in some cases, say, the Mainerbunden, to use the German expression, these sorts of associations. Um, you know, the Mainerbunden would be pre predominantly a, of men joining together in groups like that. Other kinds of associations that would include women as well, or exclusively women, but in any case, that attempt to um, uh, establish a kind of communal ethos in a way which is practicable, which uh, is reinforced by the various members of the group and which can have real world and immediate and visible effects. And I think that those are extraordinarily important. So to the extent that Patriot Front does represent a movement in that direction, I would be strongly in its favor. But again, I defer entirely to Jason. So far as the Federal Reserve goes, yes, I, I second Jason once again in everything that he said about it. I think that the, um, the system which has been established, particularly in the United States, and then from the United States and many other nations of the West, and then from there to many other nations of the world, in which we have uh, private banks which control the national economy is extraordinarily troubling. And I think that um, it's something that needs to be very strongly reconsidered from the political point of view. I agree with him that, you know, the idea of taking over the Federal Reserve is just, <laughs> it's just absolutely so far out there that it's not even worth discussing. Uh, you know, during the, the coronavirus, I mean, we've seen what the Federal Reserve can do and the power that it wields with this, um, all of its <clears throat> various efforts at intervening in the economy and attempting to uh, essentially just print money, um, you know, eh, leading one day to some kind of economic problem, either deflation or inflation or a combination of both. It's going to be a problem down the road and they're just, they're just kicking the can down the road, but they're doing so with awareness. And I think that's the main thing that has to be considered here. These are not stupid people. They are not economically ignorant. They know exactly what they're doing and they know what the probable consequences are going to be. And when they bring in organizations like BlackRock, for example, that is an indication of just where we stand. Um, and when they give organizations like inst private institutions like BlackRock the ability to, and I quote the New York Federal Reserve, to purchase unlimited numbers of treasury bonds and also to purchase corporate debt, all of this in the hands, again, of a private uh, asset firm, uh, um, an investment company, the biggest in the world, that shows us where we are. That's about all that can be said as far as that goes. I do think that there is something to be said for uh, uh, returning again to the private sphere and the individual sphere. Jason is right. We cannot print money and should not try. Um, we can look at other uh, alternatives to printing money, things like returning as much as is possible to bartering or to other kinds of you know, purely informal economic arrangements that are not in any way uh, taxable or even considerable from the point of view of the official economy of the United States. And to the extent that we're able to move into those kinds of informal economies, um, informal markets, et cetera, et cetera, informal exchanges, I think that we should absolutely take advantage of that. It is our human prerogative to make exchanges on the basis of something other than money. So. Very well said, brother. And let's get a giant round of raucous emojis going for the wonderful Quebec, a longtime participant in service to white well-being and a big salute to you, my dear friend, financially gifting fifty dollars thank you so much quebec and writing in uh, writing along with this financial gift i like this guy <laughs> talking about john thank you so much very kind i appreciate it yes indeed now we have uh we also have uh, mr fang over here making a statement uh, biden is a trojan horse he'll resign after three months to uh, due to dementia and his uh, non-white militant vice president will take over. Uh, John, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it's 
Uh, it's a scenario that I regard as entirely possible. At this point, I am just you know, unwilling to make any kinds of predictions about anything that's going to happen on the, the level of the presidency. Um, I certainly got Trump very much wrong in the last election. You know, I thought that it was impossible for a man like that to be elected. So uh, clearly I'm not as keen as I ought to be with this sort of prognostication. Um, I will say that I think... Um, all bets are off so far as the, the coming election goes. Uh, I would not even be surprised if some kind of crisis or catastrophe were to emerge that which would affect the, uh, the, uh, the results of said election. And I think that it's only a matter of time at any rate before we <coughs> actually do have a point, <coughs> excuse me, we do come to a point in which our longstanding electoral process is interrupted by something of the kind. But um, I, I regard Biden, of course, he's a dangerous individual. He should not be president of the United States by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Uh, he would be a tool in the hands of greater powers than him. He would be a, a shadow puppet, and or a puppet rather, in the hands of the shadows. And I, mm -hmm. I think that that much is evident. It would not be surprising if they manipulated him even to the extent of replacing him with another. Yeah. Yeah, that is, uh, to talk about an empty vessel. His eyes get more vacuous by the day. Uh, <laughs> right, interesting. Let's, let's see, we have so Sovereign Erie back with talking about the, I guess, the Patriot Front, and this is why the questions were together. Uh, they they did a demonstration outside the Federal Reserve on July 4th. Oh. And some bitch. I, I would say to that, see, that's one of the tactical errors that the organization is making. That is less than a gnat vexing a lion it is you, you need to be going to our brothers and sisters uh with a curative contagion that frees them see that's a, that's a great amount of energy and time that was wasted because there just wasn't uh there, there wasn't the intelligence and uh stratagem behind it to effectuate a uh, valuable outcome what is it what good is it going to do to tell people uh, the, your average plumber accountant lawyer neurosurgeon what good is it going to do to tell them that the Fed Reserve is X, Y, Z? They can't, they have as, as little power as you do. Now we have uh, Tony asking a question or, or that, uh, or no, just saying it would be interesting if uh, I guess Mr. George and I were to interview the wolves of Vinland as uh, they are in Virginia, where I am, the once great state of Virginia. I'm outside of uh, Mordor, the nation's capital, Washington, D.C. <laughs> on the Potomac. And uh, the, they're a little bit further in the central Virginia, but that will just simply never happen, I'm afraid, Tony, because they absolutely personify the ne'er-do-well in the anti-white narrative. I'm sure there are wonderful people in that organization and they want to do and accomplish magnificent things for our people. Uh, but the 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 fighting, the the, the bare-fisted fighting, and uh, all of with each other in, in training and all of this other sort of thing that is perfectly would would resemble everything that the anti-whites say about us. And then they uh, all of our brothers and sisters out there would not only see people who are maybe you'll say, well, these are real men, and they're just they're just getting ready for but, but the inevitable or something like that. But the bottom line is that our brothers and sisters out there seeing that sort of behavior will also see uh, everything that they have seen in news and entertainment media over the years and uh, all fictionalized, it doesn't matter. And they'll see the desire to exterminate non-white babies and everything else. So uh, they will absolutely never appear uh, on tap. Uh, certainly, I mean, could, could you imagine uh, we have John with us and then next week we have one of the Wolves of Finland. Uh, I think a little in in incongruity there. Uh, Art Acrobats says, should everyone in the white positive sphere make public statements denouncing violence? Will this protect us somewhat in the future? Yes, we should always, always do two things. And this came out, uh, what, a year and a half ago when I debated and defeated uh, the folks from the propertarian uh, bent of, of thinking. And that is not only do you reject violence, but you also reject that anything good would would accrue to us in the event of violence. Um, and uh, I don't know, John, if you have any thoughts that you'd like to add to that, please do. Well, I, I agree entirely. I think that um, apart from the question of principle, which is involved in it, I think that the, the simple question of uh, 
practicality and pragmatism is overruling in this case, uh, what could it possibly accomplish? What good could it possibly accomplish? Violence, that is. I mean, it, it has so far done absolutely nothing for us. And it is impossible to imagine a scenario in which it would do something for us, save in the complete and total breakdown of the social order surrounding us. And in that case, it's even senseless to attempt to, you know, produce any kind of coherent view about what should or shouldn't be done because we're dealing with anarchy at that point. Precisely. Precisely. Very well said. Now, here we have uh, Volkish Warrior over on Entropy uh, asking, what can I say to my black-pilled American friends saying that the country is lost after the No Ban Act? Now, first, I will ask you, John, do you know what the No Ban Act is? I actually do not know what the No Ban Act is. If somebody could fill me in on that, I would be grateful. Yes, fortunately, we have had a, uh, a wonderful young lady uh, fill me in on what it is, and that is that it is the the Congress has passed this, and it will go to the Senate, and then it will go to the President, and uh, if uh, Trump decides to not sign it, they they may have the votes to force it into law without him signing it. And so to save face, he might go ahead and sign it. And essentially what it would do is it would, and it would absolutely take place when Biden uh, it, it becomes president, either this coming term, which, uh, which he won't, I predict a Trump victory, uh, or the next four years later. Can you imagine how vacuous he will be then uh, in a wheelchair with drool? And He'll be still, even more ready. Yes, yes. So uh, essentially what it is, is it bans the president, it prevents the president from being able to ban immigration to the United ah. States. And uh, of course, right now they're, they're using economic reasons to say to limit immigration. This would prevent the president from being able to do that. So do you have any thoughts on that? It is, of course, abhorrent. It is not surprising. Um, I imagine we're going to be seeing more legislation like this proposed and quite possibly passed in the coming days and coming years, particularly. Um, I think that as far as the, the wider point is concerned of speaking to somebody who is hopeless on the basis of any individual piece of legislation, I mean, my question would be to them, if you really are going to change your mind about the prospects for our country on the basis of legislation, what made you wait for this particular act? We are in very, very dire straits. We have been for a long time. The infrastructure is already strongly present in the United States for the establishment of an increasing uh, despotism and one which would completely, obviously, as part of its program, completely eradicate the ethnic basis of our nation. So, I mean, th there's no reason, I think, this particular act, again, to repeat, it is abhorrent. It should not, it is clearly contrary to every basic principle of good statesmanship, nationalism, ethnic integrity, what have you, but it is not uh, you know, the cherry on the cake or anything like that. It's, it's, it's uh, just another piece in a long line of very, very deleterious um, legislation. What could be said, I think, to such a person sure. in particular, though, is uh, we, in, in the first place, I, I don't think that even if we were to concede that we are in a position which will never have any chance of victory, that is an adequate argument not to fight. That would be my first remark. Even if we concede everything that a, a black pill the person says or what have you, that, that our case is hopeless, yep. that does not mean that we should cease to fight. There is still nobility in the fight. There is still a reason that we are attempting to establish something better than what we see around us. And that is self-justifying just, self for our struggle. Um, you know, past that, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what kind of um, boundaries we can put on the realm of the possible, particularly on the basis of a mere piece of legislation. We have seen just how useless uh, legislation is. It's, it's, it's worth as much as the paper that it's written on. What's much more important is the will which stands behind it. And if anyone is so certain of the future that they are willing to put parameters around what that future could or could not contain, then they are privy to some kind of a wisdom which I am very, very ignorant of, and perhaps they could you know, illuminate me. But I think that it's important to recall that we do not know what tomorrow contains and that it depends entirely on our actions. So, I mean, it, it's just that I think is, is quite adequate to undermine the position of one who says that we are hopeless and we should not be fighting.
I want to quickly just say that, folks, that we are we're practically all out of time. We've gone well over. We've we've held John. He's being a great sport. We do want to ask him about his book and uh, quickly. So if you all have any financial gifts, we will absolutely get those as soon as we approach this subject matter. And then we're going to let John go on to bed. So, Mr. George. Mr. George, what am I, what am I doing? What am I doing? I, uh, I was just, I thought John was done before. I was just going to say with the no ban act, that's one of the most fundamental offices, um, fundamental right. responsibilities. No, it's clearly president, unconstitutional. President, clearly excuse unconstitutional. Me. unconstitutional. I mean, that, that's not just yeah. the minimum that could be said. And yes, John has a book called the new Prometheans and we'll have him back to you specifically speak about that but jason were you saying that were you handing it over to me to give um yes, yes details yes, and things like that are we at that okay all right so my site is thegreatorder.com it's a catalog for everything that i do so please go check out what is there the video content and otherwise it's a record of everything i've done from the beginning so you can go and check out archives and you can see articles and poetry and all sorts of things and a lot more coming down the pike. I will speak to that when the time is right. Uh, but the shared site for Jason and I, this show, and some of the media that's produced by you, our very community, is on the afterparty.tv. We got Entropy back up and working today, so you can watch it right there embedded. These live shows, when we're streaming, you can watch right there via Entropy on the site. Entropy does currently pull from YouTube, but they are working on pulling their feed from other platforms as well. We say this a lot, but please do remember it is about the community. It is not about the venue. So if you like, if you have a favorite band and you were used to seeing them at a certain theater every time they toured and came through your town, and then a new theater was built on the other side of town, and the next time the band comes through, they're going to be playing in that new theater. You wouldn't go to the old theater. It's not about the venue. I know most of you are used to being on this very platform um, that <laughs> our friend Susan is at the helm of right now. I won't even say its name, uh, but guys, they hate us and our our days here, I don't think we need to be, uh, uh, hold the crystal ball to know our days here are not unlimited. So please do, if you saw, went to the social media, the big tech Silicon Valley social media sites tomorrow and Jason and myself, we're not there anymore. Please do bookmark the afterparty.tv Go there, um, all of our material collectively, and then links to both of our separate sites are there. You can certainly put the pieces back together if something like that were to happen. But in the meantime, even if it doesn't, we really do recommend that you get in the habit and also share with others who are new to this of watching on alternative platforms. And increasingly, especially once Entropy is pulling from different streaming services of just watching it right on our site, that would be the best way to do it. We want to get that being the first thing you think of, not the tube. Anyway, having said that, John, it's always a pleasure. We know we'll be speaking to you again soon. And, I look forward uh, Jay, to that very much, gentlemen. Likewise, the pleasure's been ours. And uh, I see that the audience, the chat, had a wonderful time Glad feasting on all of this. Again, the link to John's article will be in on the particular post on the afterparty.tv and again our respective websites for me thegreatorder.com for jason no white guilt dot org o r g so anywhere you go we'll have the relevant links to where you can find john his work as the editor-in-chief of arctos and this particular article which believe it or not even with all we did today which has been wonderful we still did not get to everything in that vast article that john has given us a wonderful uh piece that really captures the moment we are in right now one for the record book so go read that and uh let john know if you like it and support his work but with that jason i give it to you to take us out all right well what we're going to do right now is we do have a financial gift from the great slots another rising star in the white positive sphere doing truly magnificent things and today also financially gifting ten dollars for the show thank you so very much dear brother. And what I want to do now is uh, pass it over to John and let him tell us where folks can find him, where folks can find his most relevant material, what he will be working on next. And then we, I will give the final remarks and we will tap out of here, John. 
Well, so as stated before, uh, most of my work, my recent work, can be found on Arct www.arctos.com. That's the official website of Arctos Media Limited. Uh, some of my older works can be found on my <laughs> by now absolutely decrepit and outdated uh, website, johnbrusleonard.com, <laughs> but I, I am considering refurbishing that and adding some more material. Um, and uh, I might have some more books on the horizon as well, so we'll see about that. But. At any rate, that's uh, that's about it for me. There are uh, also um, podcasts, Arctos podcasts. We have an interregnum, the interregnum podcast, excuse me. That's the name of the podcast, which we um, use to talk about many of the themes that are related to the work that we publish. And of course, we have new projects which uh, are um, coming out with some regularity, two to three books every month. And so I, mm. I do encourage everyone to check in. There's a, there's a lot of... Um, very varied work for uh, a variety of different tastes and interests. Yes, if, if you like this episode of TAP, please do check out Interregnum, the podcast from Arctos. John hosts, and he has guests of very high caliber, often Arctos authors, but others as well. If you like this kind of nuanced, holistic, deep, sweeping take of what is going on, and if I may say, I hope it doesn't sound patting ourselves on the back after what I just said, but we were among, we we're humbled to be among the guests. Jason and I appeared uh, yeah. last September on episode number 39. It was a great conversation. I well, highly spoke, recommend it. Spoke a lot about Americanism and our ties with Europe and the um, all the nuances around that, the pros and cons and wider talks about our general European identity. A lot there. It was a great conversation. Again, cataloged on the websites. If you want to check that out, or you could go to the Arctos Media YouTube channel, of course. But we know what I said before. You want to get out of that habit. Anyway, Jason. Amen to that. Well, it has been Amen an absolutely splendid night with, with John. We will absolutely have him back. Uh, I want to give a big thank you to Roy Danton for moderating uh, in the live chat tonight. Did a fantastic job, as is always the case. Thank you, my dear brother. A big thank you to everyone who was in the live chat and commenting. And uh, it was great to see you all here. A heartfelt thank you to everyone who financially gifted over the course of the night, especially to uh, Quebec for appearing again with that wonderful $50 financial gift. Great to see you, brother. And I want to spotlight a few people I saw in over the course of the night. Let's see. I saw Sterling Price, a big spotlight on and salute to you. I saw Evil Chars was with us tonight as well. A, a salute to you, brother. Colt Python, magnificent uh, tool for self-defense, for fun, for target practice, and uh, get a strong wrist when you use that uh, firearm. Hero of Alexandria was here. A big salute to you. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. So was Tiger Fox, and uh, that's a cool name. Great to see you, and so many other wonderful people. I saw a, a late question here. I think it was by Ash asking about what if we decided not to call ourselves white but ethnic europeans well i think if you were talking to an anti-white with the mental aptitude of a four-year-old you would probably have outwitted them otherwise they will say same thing dummy we're still going to discriminate against you but it's been magnificent tonight and uh, i love every single one of you these shows are so meaningful and so many folks are, are reaching out even now uh, talking about how much they love john today please share this URL with everyone you know, and uh, make sure this information gets out to the broader sphere uh, of uh, all the work that we are doing here, all the work that John and the great folks over there at Arctos are doing. And we look forward to seeing you all again.